Hey, welcome back to the Please Don't Fire Me podcast. Pastor Jeremy, Pastor Craig here, giving you all the information you need to live your life. I don't know. I, I'm sorry. For the Lord. <laughs> For the Lord. At least, yeah, yeah finish, Hopefully. finish well. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully, live your life upright before I would, the Lord. I wouldn't yeah. say we're the only sources you want to go to. Well, I'm telling you, hopefully. you were reading some of the titles from previous podcasts. So it's been a while since we've done a podcast. Mm -hmm. We're getting more sporadic, but you and I are kind of committed to getting ourselves a little bit back on track with this. So hopefully if you've been sticking with us, if you're one of the three people that are still listening, um, you can tell your friends that, hey, we're back. There you go. Well, back in action. I might have overbuild us there, but anyway, um, we're glad to we're glad you're joining us today. We were looking, as I was saying, we were looking over. You were looking over some of the previous podcasts and the titles for them, and boy, that was cringy. They made me nervous. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, what did I say? What did we say for like an hour about this topic? I know. I don't even I, yeah, want to know. I'm thinking, was that really a redeemable thing to talk about? If but. some older podcasts start disappearing from online, right? it wasn't an accident. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, hopefully uh, we're the Please Don't Fire Me podcast, mm -hmm. PDFM, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't think... This is funny, but I don't think today's subject is going to get us fired. But you never know. Yeah, this could be the one. I hope not. I Who think do? we're in the safe zone. I, I do. I mean, if anything, we might get thrown in jail mm. uh, in our current culture that we live in because who knows? I mean, I don't think that we're going to say anything too controversial. Today's subject matter is going to be about discipleship mm -hmm. and discipling others. And um, so I... I don't think that's going to get us in trouble it shouldn't get us in trouble with the church and unless we unless i rabbit trail or take us down a rabbit trail way too far i say we really have to mess this one up yeah i we, think to get fired yeah. or in trouble so um but yeah discipleship so we you and i took a road trip mm -hmm. and we spent 16 17 quality hours together way too much time <laughs> I didn't even vehicle. I didn't even want to see you this morning. <laughs> I love you, man, but like <laughs> too much. <clears throat> Honestly, that's probably how you feel most of the time. No, <laughs> I don't want I'm to see joking. You. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah, so we drove yeah. down to Burlington, Ontario mm -hmm. from Sault Ste. Marie, uh which is yeah, it's about an 8-hour ballpark drive. Uh we had a good conversation on the way down and on the way back. Mm -hmm. The reason we were there was the AGC, which is the Associated Gospel Churches of Canada, it's a church association that we are a part of. Not mm -hmm. exactly a denomination, but it functions somewhat similar. It's hey, we'll throw in a, a shout out to Tom yes. right now. Yeah. Tom. So if you're listening, because we found out that Tom sometimes listens to our uh, live services mm -hmm. for our church. Uh, I think he does. he's our superintendent, area superintendent. Mm -hmm. And so we've got to be careful. We might get fired from way on high. We appreciate you, Tom. Depending on what we talk about. We appreciate all you do. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so. Yeah, I'll they put on this uh, event that mm -hmm. we were invited to be a part of. They brought together different pastors from within the AGC to discuss the topic of discipleship. And so there was a couple of different presenters, including Tom and another pastor, that was just giving lots of good stuff for us to think about. And so, of course, on the way back home, you and I had quite a bit of conversation about some of the stuff that we discussed there, some of the different ideas or ways we were challenged. And so we just thought, basically, we would take some of that loose information that's kind of bouncing around in our heads and put it into a podcast form. So this is not exactly super structured uh it's more like some of the things that we took away from that that we'd like to implement or bring into our ministry here at bible fellowship and yeah you, as get, a, you get to listen in as opposed to our normal podcasts which are way overproduced i'm sure yeah. like we we really <laughs> i try craig i, know, I try to do. structure them a he little always, bit pastor jeremy always tries to keep keep us on track and uh sometimes he even makes notes and things I like that. I got notes that. in front of me. He does. They're loose. Yeah. They're loose. They're not super organized, but Yeah. And it shows. 
It shows. I mean, you can tell. You listen to our podcast, and it's like we should be called, you know, the – I, I don't know, the pastor and the goofball. And yeah. I'd be the goofball that, that always <laughs> takes us off track and gets us kind of... Rabbit trails. Eh? Yeah. That's okay. Anyway, so um, discipleship mm-hmm. and what our thoughts are. So this is kind of like, I know I've said it before, but sometimes in our podcasts, um, or one of the things that inspired us doing a podcast, or one of the things anyway, was just how can we kind of involve people in... Some of our conversations, because we'll have some long conversations about different things, uh, d- you know, during the week. Usually on Tuesday, we get together, have a staff meeting, and we'll talk about all sorts of things, biblical things, things going on in current events, the church, um, all those different things. And so how can we, like, open, pull back the curtain and, and open that up for others to kind of hear? Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of what this is. Um, it's a little part of our, our thoughts and the things that inspired us or encouraged us or challenged us, whatever, Mm -hmm. as a part of this meeting. So I think it was a, first of all, I'd say, I thought it was a really valuable meeting, even though it was a long track down, a long track back. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I think it was, uh, it was valuable. I think it will bear fruit in our church in the future. Um, and you know, I, uh, I learned some things personally, um, which I didn't, you know, after what, almost 30 years in ministry, it's like, it's not so much that I think I know everything. Mm-hmm. It's just when a dog gets old, they're hard to teach. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> yeah, oftentimes you just have to just be reminded of things you already knew. Yeah. Sometimes that's, and, that's probably a and challenge stirred up a yeah. little bit more mm-hmm. brought to the surface. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, so this, um, this meeting was, I I guess to give people an idea, um, the beginning of the meeting was really going over something that has been brought up several times in different, uh, leadership gathering meetings that we've had with the AGC. And that is, uh, what is it? Four chair discipleship, I think is, Am it's, I saying it right? I believe is, so. Four is, chair discipleship. Four, it's, four it's, chair discipleship. It's a model. I think there's a book about it. Um, Dan Spader, which I'm familiar with Dan Spader's work mm-hmm. from when I was in youth ministry. Okay. So I'm. It's been around for a while then. I, I don't know if four chair discipleship. I'm oh, assuming it has been, but he did a lot of work. Sun Life, I think, was his program. Uh, you know, S O N Life, mm-hmm. and that was a program that we followed. A model that we followed in. Uh, uh, youth ministry for our junior junior high and senior high mm-hmm. um, ministries back in the day. Excuse me, um, sorry. So, yeah, and and I think he also did a lot of campus ministry, if I remember right. I do not know, and I don't even know if he's. I mean, I'm assuming he's retired now. So, uh, but the but give us give us a rundown of the gist of four chair discipleship. If I were to try to explain what that is to somebody without having the book or the material in front of me, which I don't, Mm -hmm. the loose concept of it is people need to be brought deeper in their relationship with Christ. And so the four chairs is kind of like you start in chair one and discipleship means we move you from chair one into chair two and from chair two to three and three to four. And that represents a moving deeper into your relationship with Christ. It represents a maturing in your faith and you know, the growth, the kind of growth that the Bible would talk about when it, you know, talks about us being sanctified in our faith and becoming more and more like Christ. It's loosely based on the model that Jesus portrayed in the four Gospels. So, for example, Jesus came to people and would say, well, technically, actually, it was Philip who used the language of come and see, Mm -hmm. right? He was the one who had an encounter with Jesus Jesus uh, had knowledge of Philip that seemed miraculous. He, he, how could you possibly know these things about me? So then Philip goes to his brother Andrew. I think I'm getting the story correct. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. And says, you know, uh, you need to come and see this man. I think he's the Messiah. So this is kind of like the invitation to coming to see and learn and just be exposed to Christ. And that's teaching, bringing his people to that first chair. Right. So that's yep. kind of representing chair one, somebody mm-hmm. who's unchurched, 
not a believer, potentially at most vaguely familiar with Christianity, but doesn't really know hardly anything at all. And this is kind of the invitation step. Come and see. Come to church. Come to our alpha group. Come to our small group. Come to Easter service. Come over to my house. That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Just an invitation. Uh, Then it represents from chair one to chair two is essentially giving your life to Christ. So that's from come and see to come and follow me. Right? So Jesus challenges some of the disciples with that language. Follow me. And they commit their lives to following him. That's essentially what discipleship means, right? The word disciple means student or follower. Right. So you you come and see, you're captivated by Jesus, you give your life order to him, you become a follower of him, and then from there you become a fisher of men. So now you're on ministry for the Lord. You're not right. just following him personally. You are seeking to um, to commit yourself to the things that Jesus desires you to be committed to, to serving others, to using the gifts and the abilities he's given you to minister to others. So you're kind of on mission for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth chair is essentially reproducing yourself as a disciple. So you yourself become a disciple maker. Right. Um, So those are kind of the four chairs, right? Mm -hmm. You're exposed to Christ. Chair two, you make a commitment to follow him. Chair three, You are serving others in ministry. Chair four, you're now helping other people to come to know the Lord and to grow in their discipleship. And it's essentially like a multiplication or a chain reaction down the line of history. Mm -hmm. So you and I are here because people have done that for hundreds and thousands of years. You know, the people who knew Christ shared him with others, and they believed, and then they shared him with others, and that just continued to grow all over the world, and that's why we're here, and that's right. why you're listening. And that's really how Jesus intended the gospel to be propagated, so right. it's not like you can, you know, sign up for a subscription to Jesus, you you learn and grow and, and find, you know, him and experience him, and then through the discipleship of others as people as we iron sharpens iron as we work together as we study God's word then uh then we too become people who make disciples we start with the come and see model and we continue and uh what do you, what do you call it multiplication mm-hmm. begins and right. that's really how how i believe the bible portrays the propagation of Christianity. When I say that, you know, some groups believe that their their job is to make more people a part of their group. When I say groups like religions, mm-hmm. more people a part of their religion, their religion gets bigger, it kind of takes over the world type of thing. And unfortunately, Christians are prone to that as well. So what happens is, is that what we do instead of this model of developing people to reproduce themselves we're developing people that just uh, continue to absorb more and more knowledge Mm. and um that seems to be more the goal and something that's much easier to accomplish because we all kind of get stuck at that level of okay now am i going to be that person that says come and see and am Mm -hmm. i going to be that person that walks beside somebody and, and helps them grow in their relationship to the point where they have a desire to then invite somebody to come and see and walk mm-hmm. with that person and you know and multiply. So I hope we're not moving too quickly, okay. but let's just stop Sorry. there. For, no, no, let, let's just talk about that part for a second where mm-hmm. if you're using let's say the four chair model, we get like you say basically we're getting stuck on chair 2. Mm-hmm. So in chair 1 we're trying to invite people to come to know faith. Somebody does. We're super excited about that and then they stay in chair 2 for a really long time, right? Yep. It's all about, I need to study my Bible more. I need to pray more. Uh, I need to personally become more sanctified, more knowledgeable. And over time, we can forget that we need to move from that chair into other areas of growth. We need to become leaders. We need to become servants. We need to become those who are now influencing others, trying to disciple somebody else. So... You know, one of the questions we were challenged with 
in our uh, meeting, our discipleship meeting, was put this way. It said, what is in the way of our church being better at making disciples? That was a really tough question to wrestle with. I wrote mm-hmm. that one down for that specific reason. Mm. What's in the way of our church being better at this process? And I, one of the conclusions I came to is that we put too much emphasis on chair number two or step number two, like Christian growth. And we don't necessarily emphasize chairs three and four as much as we should. Mm-hmm. So you've got then, just to paint a general picture, somebody who came to the Lord at some point in their past, uh, they d- committed themselves to church attendance, they learn a lot from sermons, you know, they, they attend church every week, maybe they're even part of a Bible study, but, but um, they don't consider themselves ready to lead. Maybe they've been a Christian for a decade or two, and they think, I'm not ready to lead a ministry. I'm not ready to share the gospel with somebody. I don't know if I feel like I'm ready for those things. Mm-hmm. And the truth is they probably were a long time ago, even though they might feel that they're not, and trying to move people from becoming sheep that are fed to you know a shepherd to other people mm-hmm. is a tough transition. Um, I don't know if you have the same perspective. Now, I'm thinking maybe a little bit specifically of our church. That might be general of all churches, right? At some point, you just start looking inward. Well, Ministries within the church and then... Well, I can I can say that uh, when we had that discussion, when we got to that point in our meeting together to talk about these things, none of that surprised me. I, I know that. And I'm not saying I know that, you know, because I'm so smart. It's just, I, I guess, because many years of ministry or whatever... Uh, Here's how I look at it. Maybe I'm divulging. Maybe I will get fired. But um, <laughs> as a pastor, you know that's happening. Mm-hmm. You know that that's not where you want to stay. And I have to say to you, you do it anyway. And there's a lot of factors involved in that. So I don't know if I'm going ahead of what you're but you, I think you asked the question, you know, what, what stands in the way of it? Mm-hmm. Um, or, or what are the things that, you know, keep us from doing it? From making more disciples. Making right? more disciples. Um, you know, and some of the things that go off in my head, first and foremost, is the intentionality of it. it you have to stay on top of it all the time. You have to make that the priority uh, because it's something that we all resist. And when I say we all, not necessarily the pastors as much as those who are hearing. We would all, and I don't, I don't want to throw our congregation under the bus or anything like that. It's just natural for anybody as a Christian to just status quo is always nice. Mm. Like we do it in our lives. We go home. We do the same things. We oftentimes find ourselves, I don't know if other people feel this way, but I do. I go home. I do the same things. I find myself getting in a rut of just doing the same, like just surviving, Mm, especially you have young kids at home. They're going to school every day. So you have the same routine. I mean, you Mm -hmm. know, you're making lunches at night, somebody else cleaning up the kitchen after supper. I mean, you know, then we get to sit down for about, you know, a half an hour, 45 minutes, and then we're asleep. And that's kind of it's Groundhog the Day. Yeah, it, is, it, <laughs> it becomes that way, right? But we know that's happening. We're like, we got to break out of this. But at the same time, we do it again tomorrow. Mm. You know, we'll just keep doing it because it's familiar and it's what we know. Mm-hmm. And Christianity in the church is oftentimes like that. And so I feel like that's what you're fighting against all the time. You're swimming upstream against that that feeling of, okay, everything's peaceful, everything's going along smoothly, my life is good, I like where I'm at, uh, I like my church the way it is, I, you know, to be challenged means that I'm going to have to make decisions, and I'm going to have to think through new things, and I'm going to have to try different stuff, and all that stuff is not necessarily scary, but it's just work, Mm -hmm. you know, and it's so easy to get along doing this without that kind of work. So um, 
I think that's what, uh, you know, that's one of the things that fights against it. And then as a pastor, you're kind of like, well, this is what everybody wants. So, you know, Mm. why rock the boat? And, and in my defense, uh, in any pastor's defense really is that's generally like you went to school to fill your head with what's in the Bible Mm. and knowledge of that. And so it's like, man, like Sunday morning, that's, that's what your job is, is to get that knowledge out there or an academy class or uh Wednesday night or, or, or a whatever, podcast, or right? a podcast or mm-hmm. anything is just to expend, uh, to put out this knowledge and then, and then, and people are more than willing to absorb it because that's very, what is it? Safe. It's kind of passive. It's very passive. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. It's still positive, but it's passive. It is. Right. Yeah. And so we just become, uh, we become, <laughs> for uh, illustrations that probably if you've been a Christian for a while, you've heard it, but we all become the Dead Sea, you know? Mm-hmm. It flows in, but it just stagnates there, and the Dead Sea is just full of minerals, so many that, so that there's hardly anything living in the Dead Sea. Mm-hmm. And the reason for it is because I think it, I, I, yeah, the Jordan River flows into it, and that's it. Doesn't flow anywhere. And it doesn't go out. It right. nothing flows through it, and that's kind of how we become as Christians. We yeah. become the Dead Sea. So if you think of it like spiritual vitality, you know, flowing mm-hmm. into you, the whole point is that it would, it would flow, flow to out. others. Yeah. yeah, you become a minister and a servant and a ambassador for Christ to those around you. Yeah, but often, like you say, tyranny of the urgent, complacency, busyness, all those kinds of that's things. Right just take over and so we're happy to do our little let's say daily devotional and that's my christian thing for the day mm-hmm. i just want to try and not screw up today too bad yep. not sin too much today yep. and hopefully tomorrow i can do it again yeah rather than being uh concerned about the lost right. right we sometimes just forget like our eternal security is sealed <laughs> we know the lord we have that joy and you can, after a while, just lose passion for those who don't know, mm. who don't have the light, who don't have the hope. And we lose sight of that yeah, easily. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, it, on top of that, it also becomes intimidating sometimes oh, yeah. to want to open up about those things to somebody. And so then you feel trapped at times. You, know? you mm-hmm. feel like nervous to, to break out of that, to talk to somebody. You're, you fear the reaction. You fear the response. Maybe you feel unequipped to do that and it's just easier it's just easier to read another christian book or keep reading your bible Mm -hmm. which i'm not discouraging for sure right but without like you say that outflow to others yeah that can be spiritually dangerous what did what did you see what did you see that were um blockers to there's there there were a lot we listed a whole bunch now dare i do this because it Mm -hmm. seems like an excuse Mm -hmm. and maybe it is Mm -hmm. but the pandemic Mm -hmm. definitely killed some momentum yes i mean the church our church and a lot of other churches by and large went into survival mode Mm -hmm. um you know there was less people connecting to our church on a weekly basis we were obviously forced at for long stretches of time to go purely digital, which is a less than ideal form of ministry. I think it's valid in some respects, but it certainly limits you. Um, you know, we stripped down a bunch of our ministries that really only could be done in person. And so a whole bunch of what we did just dried up immediately. Um, of and course, we got very distracted. We got distracted. Mm-hmm. We got discouraged. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of us were, well, there was a lot of emotional issues. You know, people were struggling mm-hmm. financially. So then the church is also somewhat struggling financially. And you're, you're, all of a sudden your focus goes to trying to make sure we've got the technology to get a service and make sure we have enough people to make a service happen right. and make sure that we meet the bill payments without falling behind. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden it's like six months later, you just... You're still thinking about that. A yeah. year later, you're still thinking about that. It's very hard to... Then, on top of that, there's the after effects. So we're emerging out the other side of that. We haven't had to do online services in a while. Mm-hmm. We've been meeting in person. Praise God for that. 
We've been able to take our masks off. Praise God for that. But a, a lot of people never woke back up. No, nope. A lot of people never yep. came back to church. Mm-hmm. They're still watching online or they even fell out of that habit. Mm-hmm. And so there is definitely a, a lethargy that's come over everybody. It's very hard. So I'm tempting. it's tempting not to use that one because it feels like mm-hmm. an excuse. Right. But it's also a reality um, that we need to break out of that and get back on mission. And our mission is to make disciples. In fact, that's our church's mission statement. Right. We exist to, to make, make disciples, disciples by the grace of God to the glory of God. Mm-hmm. And we we don't exist simply to exist. You know, we don't exist to stagnate. We exist to be on the move, to be on the march for the Lord. Now, <clears throat> One criticism that I had when we were driving down there was that we're going to get another lecture on how we need to make disciples and, you know, we're going to get all the, all the nuances of what it takes to make disciples and to do this and everything like that. And, uh, the problem is we're still not solving some, some basic problems, which is, how many people do we have to disciple? Mm. <laughs> you know, like how many people are really willing to engage with this and willing to jump on board? And it feels like oftentimes we as a church, we just keep educating ourselves. We keep quoting the scriptures that challenge us to go out and make disciples. And somehow that's supposed to inspire us and everybody's supposed to rise up and do it. And yet I confess that by going doing this, raising that awareness, even in my own heart has caused me to say, yeah, that's what we need to do. We need to inspire people to want to make disciples. We need to show people the mission field. We need to be intentional about challenging people, ourselves included, to be disciple makers. And, you know, it, that's that's all valuable and important and it was so for me that was probably the biggest i i guess the most valuable part of being a part of the whole conversation it wasn't about what i didn't know and needed to know or things like that as much as it was just being kind of kicked in the butt a little bit to get on on that track and to challenge people a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. There there needs to be an awakening, a challenging, an inspiration, mm-hmm. um, and an intentionality. That was the word that you used. Mm-hmm. The reason you have to be intentional about it is because discipleship, a huge part of it comes down. It, it's basically a combination of intentionality and time. Mm-hmm. You need those two elements yep. to make it happen. Because, you have to have the desire yes, to do it, Yeah, but you also have to... Be willing yeah. to make the sacrifice of time right. to do it. So Jesus, if you're if you're using his his example or his model, right? Uh, the crowds were willing to follow him. That's as far as they were willing to go. Mm-hmm. Then he had disciples, and by disciples, the Bible talks about more than twelve, right? Something like so seventy or one twenty. Yeah, there were right. mentions of yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. there was some generic number of of disciples who were committed to following him and being a student. They weren't just interested in the fishes and the loaves. Right. And then you pair that down to the 12 who went with him everywhere. Mm -hmm. And you can even narrow that down to a core group of three, Peter, Mm -hmm. James, and John, who Jesus had a few very specific encounters, like going up on the mountain, Mm -hmm. and he raised a young girl from the dead, and they were the only three invited to be a part of that. Mm Mm-hmm. And so it's almost like the deeper the commitment, the less people are going to be there right. for it. Mm-hmm. And you just have to uh, accept that mm-hmm. um, as, a, as a natural reality of life, but be willing to move forward anyways. So one of the things that just made me think of, and I think I said this to you on our drive home. Now, I'm not sure if I mean this literally, but I kind of do. I said to you, you and I need to spend less time together. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the reason I mean, the reason I say that is, you know, when I first came on to staff here at Bible Fellowship, I had just come out of Bible college. I was 22, 23 years old, very, very green in ministry, 
um, had a lot to learn. And one of the things that you did right away was say, every Tuesday morning, we're going to meet together. We're going to talk about, like you said earlier in the podcast, just about anything, right? What's going on in your life? What's going on in the ministry? Let's talk about stuff about the church, etc. And we've done that for years. Mm-hmm. Literally up until this day, we still do that. Mm-hmm. And that's been a massive influence in my growth and discipleship because essentially you mentored me and carved out this time to do that, mm-hmm. right? Where you were willing to mm-hmm. allow me to come to you with questions and problems and issues, and you gave me assignments to do and things like that. And, and, and actually, I'm quite grateful. I'm grateful to the church because they hired somebody to spend time with me. Yeah, that's basically <laughs> what they did, yeah. They had to pay me, Craig, I'm sorry. I know, I know. <laughs> you had to pay somebody to be my disciple. Yeah. Sorry to put it that way. Um, now, I'm not saying that my disciple formation is done. You know, I'm not no, saying that. Right. But one of the things that I come you're to cer- my mind you're is... You're certainly at the fourth chair where you reproduce. Yeah. You know, that's it's, the It's goal. almost like maybe this is the time where you and I need to pick a new person. Right. And you're going to spend a weekly block of time with them, and I'm going to spend a weekly block of time with them, and we're going to do that over again. Mm-hmm. Not that we're going to stop meeting, but that's right. that's the kind of thing that this discipleship reproducing model looks like. Mm-hmm. Somewhere along the way, you've got to say, I need to pick somebody. Now, Jesus did this full time, so he had 12 that he was committed to, which is a lot, mm-hmm. but they also sounds like they kind of lived and traveled together. Mm -hmm. And then he had the three. So I'm not saying that we can have 12 Mm -hmm. to that degree because the chances of us giving up our job and spending our whole week with 12 people is pretty small. Mm -hmm. But maybe you can have one or two, right? Maybe there's somebody in the church or in your life circle that you can identify as somebody who is potentially eager to learn is teachable and could use the investment of a more mature believer. And you may think, I'm not ready to do that. You right. probably are. Oh, yeah. You probably yep. are. And it, yep. You're mm-hmm. ready way earlier than you think you are. Exactly. Because you, if you're waiting for you to become the perfect teacher right, in order to become a teacher, well, guess what? You're going to die before you become that teacher. Right. You'll never get there. Part of And actually, you won't learn much about being a discipler until you start to disciple. Yes, you do have to learn it on the fly. It's, it's something that the challenges that come up in the process of doing that force you to turn to the Word, right. force you to turn back to those who are, are hopefully mentoring you mm-hmm. and ask questions. Uh, you know, there'll be challenges. There'll be times where you want to quit. There'll be all kinds of things that God w- will use in that experience to help you become a, a better uh, disciple. Yeah, I mean, others. not not to put words in your mouth, but mm-hmm. when you took me under your wing, it's not as if you had nothing to learn. No. Or you were perfectly ready for that challenge. I'm sure in that process, I challenged oh, you as well, and you, you know, figured out ways in which you were falling short as a mentor. And brother, I am grow. still flying by the seat of my pants. There you go. Okay? And I'm trying to keep up with the uh, student by the way. Yeah. So I learn a lot from you too. But so that's the point though. We all right. are, right? Iron sharpens iron. Jesus mm-hmm. is the only perfect teacher and mentor that's ever walked the face of this earth. The rest of us are broken vessels, but God uses these jars of clay yeah. to continue his ministry. It, it brings to mind something that I don't know if it specifically came up in our conversation down in Burlington mm. in that meeting, but it it does challenge me to think of this this way. There is a very deceptive idea in our minds that in order to duplicate ourselves in, in the most efficient manner, and especially in a day and age where everybody's going a million miles an hour in, in hundreds of different directions, they've got family obligations, got all these things pulling at their time and things like that, that what we do is we try to make the process more efficient. And so as pastors, especially, we get suckered into the idea that uh, if I get up and preach a really good message, I'm discipling somebody. Mm. And the fact is, is that that is hopefully spurring people on. That's hopefully helping to engage them with their faith. It's, it's hopefully keeping them on the right track with God 
instead of wandering off. Those are all goals of, say, preaching on a Sunday it's a morning. Good thing. Those are all good and valuable things, but they don't produce disciples. And the reason they don't produce disciples is because what you just pointed out, which is disciple making is really a one-on-one. I mean, Jesus was God. He was the word. It's not like he had to remember the word. Mm. It's not like he had to teach the word. He lived the word. And so him taking on 12 and developing a, a group of people that he could say to at the end, go and make disciples of all nations and give them that mandate and send them out with confidence that they were going to be able to go and do that is partly a production of his his own him being Lord and God and and having that, um, you know, being the word himself. And that doesn't mean that we're not able to do that in some form. Mm-hmm. Maybe there's two or three. Maybe there is kind of an official way of discipling people. Maybe some people are able to do that, you know, like Paul was the super disciple maker, if you mm-hmm. will, went planted churches, spent time with elders, did, you know, uh, mentored Timothy, did all these things. But for the most part, most of us, and even myself included, one is is where we need to start. Mm. It's just one-on-one, spending time with people, mm-hmm. spend time with them, mm-hmm. spend enough time with them, and all of a sudden, things come out, mm-hmm. you know? Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can cite all kinds of examples right now of how that's happening in in my life like i'm this is these opportunities are coming up for me recently and uh and have down, you know obviously they come across my desk more frequently than other people mm. for instance uh just by virtue of of my role as pastor but let me say this there's a lot of time like i've I'm looking around myself, and after going to this meeting, I'm starting to go, oh, yeah, there's this person. Mm. And I've been in contact with this person, but I haven't been as intentional as I should be Mm -hmm. or need to be. And I've got to see that God has superintended these opportunities. But I, as a pastor, am susceptible to, to falling into falling prey to the idea that you know I can do the most good say on Sunday morning for instance mm. with a sermon when in reality the greatest change that I can see in the world is going to happen one by one or one by two or whatever it is on that small on that micro level uh, that's going to have more of an impact long term because the other one is just producing more people floating around in the Dead Sea, so to speak. Mm. You know, uh, we're just absorbing, absorbing, absorbing. What are, we, what are we doing with it? How's it flowing out? Yeah, there so. definitely has to be that follow up, right? Where you transition from, you know, being fed the word into action because mm-hmm. Christianity is both. I mean, you can't starve yourself. So, right. you know, I don't think we should minimize. Ministry of the Word, personal devotions, growing in your knowledge, things oh, like no, that. Oh, no, not at all. I mean, those are things that, but those are things that equip us to be better disciplers. Right, right. And so, that you know, again, going back to it, and I'm going to restress the point because I think it just flies over our heads so easily. You just have to look around you, look at the people that you're in contact with all the time, that know Christ already, mm-hmm. that you, they're you have the opportunity to intentionally help them become disciple makers themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's that simple. It is not complicated. As soon as you step out and become a discipler, you are on the track of showing them how to disciple someone else. Mm -hmm. And we need to just continue that pattern if we follow the model of Jesus, one of the things, because he certainly preached to the crowds, mm-hmm. but a key part of his discipleship, let's say his example, was doing things together and on the fly, mm-hmm. right? So as he ministered to people, his disciples were with him. A lot of times they didn't get it, right? Mm-hmm. They interfered. They 
said, don't bring the children. Mm -hmm. Or they said, send the crowd away. We can't feed them. And then he used those as teachable moments. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I think of is even if somebody's listening to this and thinking, oh, you know what? I, I do need to be more intentional. And, and picking, like, say, one person to try and be more intentional with sounds like a reasonable starting point. You're not demanding that I start a small group of 12 or something. Mm -hmm. Just highlight somebody and try to be more intentional. I still don't feel, some people might think, that I have the time. Right. So what Jesus, rep what he models, I think there's a transferable principle, which is you don't necessarily have to add a lot of things to your schedule as much as bringing people into what you're already doing. Right. Now, I've already got some ideas in my own mind about how to do this. So, for example... You know, in my youth ministry, you know, we've got some we've got some things that we do on a regular basis, right? Every youth group event includes some kind of Bible teaching, some kind of, you know, games or activities and a snack basically is like the, the generic formula for a youth event. And I try to delegate some of those responsibilities, but I'm not always as intentional as I should be about helping people uh, work through those processes. So, for example... Uh, the other night we did a game that was an elimination game, okay? Like students are playing. If you are the last one to complete the action, you're eliminated and you keep doing it until uh, there's just one winner. Now, one of the things that I observed about this happening in front of me is the students who are getting eliminated are bored. If they're like mm. some of them don't necessarily want to watch and then they become disruptive and so it's like, here's a teachable moment that I didn't take advantage of where I should have taken the person who planned this game afterwards aside and say, listen, here's the strengths and weaknesses of an elimination game. Mm -hmm. When you eliminate students, they have nothing to do. Some of them get disruptive or distracted. They want to leave the room and go do something else. So keep that in mind as you plan a game. That's something that I didn't take advantage of mm -hmm. just as an idea. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't have taken me any more time. Like I was already there. Right. That person was already there. Yeah. So if you're involved in something already, this isn't necessarily about adding extra things to your calendar per se. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be, but this is the easiest way to do it is to bring somebody along with what you're already doing. So if you're involved in a project at the church or you're doing some kind of ministry or you're going to visit somebody who's sick and elderly or something like that, bring someone with you. Mm -hmm. That's the easiest way to disciple Absolutely. on the fly and model for them what it looks like to go about these things and, and what you're thinking and how you're intending to react. And then afterwards, just like Jesus did, he kind of debriefed mm -hmm. with his disciples after certain events happened. You know, they had little follow up conversations about here's why here's the thing that you you missed. You missed mm -hmm. the point, guys. Here's what you should have learned from this. Mm -hmm. I just feel like that's a that's a good starting point because it's a manageable mm. starting point. You know, you're not demanding somebody to give up tons of extra time. It's bite size. Right. Think about what you're already engaged in. See if you can add somebody into that. Good. Good. So um you know, there was uh, maybe I'm shifting gears a little bit. Those that's a good example. Uh it kind of reminds me that one of the things we talked about, yeah, I think even before we might have gotten to this meeting, uh, but we did, I, I brought it up at the meeting as well, is that a lot of times we don't build that expectation into our, like for people in the church, you're involved in ministries in the church and there's various different things you can do. Everything from, well, you know, being part of the cleaning staff that that or a cleaning team that cleans the building every week, um, or being in cafe or or working with youth in in youth ministry, being a Sunday school teacher, all these things. And the one thing that we don't do is we need to like put that in those job descriptions. Mm. We need to develop intentionality at that level. That hey, I'm a part of this, and this is this is the ultimate uh this is the effect or or the way this affects the whole body and and what kind of uh how valuable this is in the context of the whole church and for the kingdom of god ultimately 
So we need to kind of connect those ideas, and we also need to connect that I'm working with people, and I have a responsibility to help those people grow in their walk with God and challenge them to be disciple makers in the sphere of influence in that ministry that they're in. And, and just kind of building it into every part of our church. Now, do you think, do you think that contrasts with sort of a, an unintentional mentality that when I volunteer for something, let's say, I'm just filling a hole? Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. If I'm signing up to be a Sunday school teacher, okay, it's just because they it. needed another person. Let's just admit it, though. You and I, okay, we are on the beginning of all of those different volunteer roles and things like that. And we don't uh, obviously don't influence every one of them or anything like that. Some of these ministries we didn't even come up with. Uh, oftentimes we're tasked with trying to make trying to make those ministries continue on. And that means that we need personnel to do it. You and I oftentimes are the ones getting up front and challenging people to consider maybe being a part of this ministry, like especially you with a lot of the student ministries takes a lot of volunteer resources. And so those opportunities, uh, you know, you're, I mean, again, we don't necessarily bill them like, oh, this is a great ministry opportunity as much as we're like, would somebody please help me? Yeah. You know, somebody please fill this role. I mean, I got to have another Sunday school teacher, right? That's right. You know, and so again, I mean, we kind of kickstart it. I'll take the responsibility. It. Yeah. Well, yeah, we kind of, I do it too. We kind of kickstart it and give, you know, start out the whole process wrong mm. in, in terms of, you know, this has kingdom implications. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I think when we raise some of those things, so for you and I, that's something to keep in mind. And even for other ministry leaders, like in our church, we have elders, we have deacons. Both those roles have responsibilities to, you know, uh, help uh, ful- uh, fill some of these ministry obligations and and leadership roles, and that's one of the reasons we select these people is because they're recognized not only as servants in the church, but servant leaders that are leading different areas of ministry that have influence over people, and we need to begin to challenge them. We need to begin, we all Mm -hmm. as a team really need to begin to challenge ourselves to be disciplers in those different roles, Mm -hmm. And, and how can we you know, uh, be, do this more intentionally. If we don't focus on becoming a disciple making church mm-hmm. and make that an intentional effort, we will die. Right. I mean, that is how churches die. Yep. Churches all over Canada are already plateaued and dying. Mm-hmm. And this is why, mm-hmm. because they become inward focused they become sur- and in some survival cases, focused. In some cases, COVID has become the grim reaper. Yeah, uh, they were I mean, already on yeah, life support. they were support, on life support, and, and some of these churches aren't even opening up. Yeah. You know, in that meeting that we had down in Burlington, there was a statistic that was shared that really <laughs> stuck with me, that so was. I wrote it down. So it's it was a, I believe this was from Barna Research, and it said that in North America, the average church wins 1.6 people to Christ every year per 100 attenders of that church. In other words, a church that's on average 100 people on a Sunday morning will on average over the course of a year win 1.6 people, maybe one or two, to Christ every year. And I was, um, I'm not sure that that's a statistic I had heard before, so it kind of hit me afresh, let's say. Even if I had heard it, it was something I had forgotten about. And... It was just very discouraging. I mean, mm-hmm. I was like, mm-hmm. man, that is that is really disappointing. Like, that is not okay. There is a lot of effort and energy that goes into 1.6. Yeah, right? yeah that's right, I yeah. Mean, when you think about it. Yeah, and, and not saying that's the only metric no. that we should use to determine church health or things like that. Right. Um, because discipleship is more than winning someone to Christ. That's just the first step. So I don't want to make it sound... As if our only goal is get people to right. profess Christ and then we move on from there. That's not true at all. However, 
churches who are win- who are winning people to Christ have a feeling of being alive. Mm-hmm. You know that because when do you remember, listener, when your faith came alive for you? I mean, think back to that mm-hmm. era of your life when Christ became so precious to you. Mm-hmm. You saw your need for a savior, for a healer, for hope and for purpose. And Christ was the answer. And and how that just invigorated new life into you. For some people, that wasn't that long ago. For some people, that's a long ways in the rearview mirror. Mm-hmm. And we don't feel that anymore. Mm-hmm. And we've forgotten. You know, it's almost like we forget that this is what people still need. But churches that are seeing that on a regular basis, seeing people's lives changed because of the difference Christ makes, I think... I think that helps to motivate and inspire. It's almost like a creates a cycle, you know? Yeah, maybe it's not the best way to put it in terms I, I'm I agree with what you're saying and I and I, I do think it's a great motivator. And maybe it's not the best way to put this, but you know, if if you want to experience that feeling again, even and even more so, mm-hmm. watch it happen in somebody's life who you're discipling. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And 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 maybe that's not the best way to motivate people. It's like you know, it's very selfish <laughs> in the in that sense cuz it has far, further implications than just your own feelings. But sure. one thing I can say is that if you're if you're kind of languishing in the desert as a believer mm-hmm. and you're, you know, this I mean, this this is probably what's happening when you see people deconstructing their faith mm. is that a big part of it is is that they haven't it's been a long time since they discipled anyone and saw that light come on mm-hmm. in another person's life and and were a part of that mm-hmm. in a in a personal way right not, not you know getting up and preaching to a group of people and somebody coming up to me and saying oh that message really struck home or that was really you know but but just individually being able to be a part of it is even more profound. There's nothing quite like it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've got, um, you told me when I first started ministry to make a file that I put notes of encouragement in that people would give me. If, mm-hmm. if anybody gave me a little note, a little prayer, I'm praying for you, thank you for this or whatever, keep it in a file because you're going to get discouraged. <laughs> and every now and then you're going to need to pull this out and remind yourself that it's worth it and you're bearing fruit. And I've got one note in there in particular. It's the shortest one out mm. of all of them. Mm. And it says, thank you for leading me to Christ. Mm. And that's my favorite one. Yeah. And I know, I mean, I know who it's from. Mm-hmm. And it just is a, such a, such a cool room. It's like, it's the coolest feeling ever to think, yeah. really? Like God used me to do that? Mm. How? Mm-hmm. Uh, screw up like me. <laughs> 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 I'm thinking, I know all the ways in which I totally messed it up, you know, trying to work with this person. Uh-huh. And yet God used me to to change their life and bring them to faith. And and uh, yeah. it's just nothing like that. And wow. I just want to encourage the listeners that God can and will use you the same way. Yep. This is not just a nope. pastor thing, right? It's not like, oh, yeah. I never went to Bible college. I'm not in full-time ministry. Forget all that. Yeah. He wants to use you, and he can use you. He used these disciples after Christ had spent only a couple of years with them. Mm-hmm. Then he sent them out into the world, you know, quite raw. They made lots of mistakes. And these were ordinary people mm-hmm. who had an encounter with Christ that changed their life, and then they just shared that with I others. Was, I just love the story where uh, in Joshua, one of my favorite books in the Bible, but uh, the the priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, and the um, the 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 commandment to them is, you need to step into the raging river, and then you'll be able to cross. Mm. You know, I mean that's and so they go in. I don't know, knee deep, waist deep. I don't know how far right. before that river that's at flood stage that's during the harvest season is flowing by there before that river stops and you know that's what it means to step out and disciple somebody you got to step into that river and then faithfully see god do what he does through you Mm -hmm. and through your words and 
Because you know what? If you go into making disciples and you're thinking to yourself right now, you're thinking, I don't know what I'm doing. You are the perfect disciple maker. <laughs> you're in good company. You, yeah. <laughs> and and that's the best place to be because now you have to step into the water and see what God does because listener, listen, God's the one that does it. Mm-hmm. It isn't you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's, uh, you know, if, if you think that you've got to reach a certain level in order to do this work of discipling others and reaching the lost and sharing the gospel and challenging them to grow and challenging them to become disciple makers, if you think that that's your work to do, then you, you're already sunk right in the mm. beginning. It, it is God's work. He just needs faithful people that are willing to step into the water. And I think that's that's where that real intentionality comes from, is understanding that. It's it's not about being great at it. It's mm-hmm. about doing it. Mm-hmm. It's and and we as Christians need to, and and even for Bible Fellowship Church, we need to get a new vision for this in our lives, mm-hmm. every one of us. Amen. I, I don't know. That, I think Where that's do a good go? place to wrap it is up. It, this is a good wrap up. This is a good I think time so. to. Yeah. Well, uh, I think, you know, one of the things we'll probably talk about this subject again. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it needs to be talked about again. It needs to be talked about on a regular basis. We need to uh, look at different areas of our church and how we can. Um, well, obviously, we'll be talking about it in the future around here at Bible Fellowship. And uh, anyway. I hope that that, you know, we took a long trip and I hope that our efforts in going down there and coming back and for Pastor Jeremy and I, you can pray for us that we'll stay engaged with this subject and um, and not let the daily grind <laughs> wear it out of us mm-hmm. and um, and continue to help our church body here become disciplers and multiply and have a miraculous, really a miraculous impact on Sault Ste. Marie. Mm. This is our city. And, um, if we are faithful to him in taking forth his message, go and make disciples. Mm -hmm. Um, if we do that, then he will be faithful in, producing what he wants to produce through us so amen until next time keep praying for us keep praying for us as a church keep uh um, keep us in mind in terms of you know how and and even give us some comments Uh, we'd love to read your comments how this can be more strengthening more encouraging to you uh one of the things that we reasons we started the podcast is because we want to inspire our people and and have that kind of adult Sunday school opportunity. I I think looking back on on those uh former podcasts and some of my scratched my head. I don't know what we were trying to accomplish there, but um we were anyway, learning on the fly. We were. We still are. That's right. And uh anyway, hopefully this has been an inspiration and help to you. Um until we're able to uh, get out another podcast. Uh, I just say God bless and bye for now. <laughs>